a second. So So while you're just working on that, um, today we're thinking about the the kind of strengths and the weaknesses of virtue ethics. Strengths and weaknesses of virtue ethics. And uh, this is a big part of this section of the course. Strengths and weaknesses, their theories and developments, the appropriateness of their continued application and use. Think about that maybe a bit more next couple of lessons. Uh, some, some examples, again, that's something we'll get to a little bit later. We're gonna evaluate what we've got so far in terms of Aristotelian virtue ethics. So uh, let's have a look at uh, what you've put in for our starter task. Um, so, who was it? Uh, Jesus was Jesus really a virtuous role model? That's interesting. Um, was Jesus vicious or virtuous? Jesus was a role model for many. Yes. Uh, when he said uh, you, he called the Pharisees a brood of vipers, um, snakes, like a, a, de a, a they were. You know, he called people names. Is that is that a nice thing to do? Is that a maybe there's a reason for it? And when Jesus dies on a cross and commands his disciples to take up their cross and follow him, is that virtuous or vicious? It's really interesting to kind of think. A lot of the commentator, some of the secular readers of Jesus thought he was vicious, not a nice person. And what else have we said? Is flexibility really a good thing in ethics? This is a weakness. Well, the Kantian ethicist, the deontological ethicist who likes rules, um, would, yes, exactly say this. We need universal rules, maxims that we can live by. Um, or we need to think, the utilitarian would think of, by consequences. Very good, very good. So you've got anything else? Do ethical theories have the same practical use to be valuable? Uh, no, so that's a strength. Um, just because we can't practically use it doesn't always say it needs to be a strength. Things, selflessness and gen are always a good thing, even if they don't produce anything. Um, anybody said anything else? Did I miss anything out? Is virtue ethics a selfish theory? Um, no, because if you do it or the glory, it's not true. That's interesting. So if you try to become virtuous for the sake of being virtuous, is that vicious? <laughs> okay. All right, you can think about some of those other things in time. If you have a look at the, uh, the lesson PowerPoint, we're gonna go through a few things to do with virtue ethics, um, just for a little bit. And we're gonna think first of all about strengths and then weaknesses, the strengths and the weaknesses of virtue ethics, and then we'll see what you remember having, having done that. So, if we time, we could review Aristotle's virtue ethics. I could set you this eight marks question as a possible exam question. Explore Aristotle's virtue ethics, and we could go through, I'm sure, that quite easily. You could talk about eudaimonia as the, the well-lived life. You could talk about uh, Aristotle's theory of the golden mean, and you could construct an eight mark essay. I'm sure you can do that. Um, so, in future lessons, we will look at Alistair MacIntyre, Philippa Foote as key scholars, but there are a whole host of modern scholars, uh, and I include Aquinas in this list of people who developed the theory, but in the modern world, Elizabeth Atscombe, um, was one, and then later on, Hearst House and uh, Nausum. Um, we might go ahead and look at some of those before future lessons. So what do we need to do today? We need to know what are the strengths and the weaknesses of Aristotle's theory. If you're taking notes, you might start with strengths and then go to weaknesses, or you might have a, a table where you just summarize. I'm trying to summarize six strengths, 
six weaknesses. Um, we're not going to get to Aquinas probably today. That'll be next lesson uh, and the relevance of some of that. Okay, so our six, we're just going to go through six uh, virtue ethics strengths and check that you, you, you understand all of them. And then we'll go on to six virtue ethics. Uh, if not virtues, then vices. So first of all, the virtues of virtue ethics, then the vices of virtue ethics, as it were. Um, so we're going to look at, what's this phrase, non-normative, that it's culturally relative, it's liberal, humanistic, it fits a religion, encourages community and rejects individualism. So this is the strengths of virtue ethics. So this first phrase, it's non-normative. Now, so what do you mean by something normative? Um, so it doesn't give a prescriptive rule, a law that you should follow that says it's right or it's it's wrong. Now, that might strike, strike you either as a strength or a weakness, and that's the case. We'll come back to that in a minute. But what it does do is give you freedom. Freedom as the individual, as the agent, to be in control of your own morality. And for many people, that's important, particularly in the modern world. Uh, imagine anybody trying to tell you how to behave. You would say, no, nobody can tell me how to behave. So we value freedom today. So this would seem a strength of the theory. Um, people today want to be able to make their own laws for a living. They don't want to rely. They're secular. They don't want to rely on a god or a deity or a book to tell them how to behave. They want to live by their own rules. So on this argument, it's non-normative nature is a strength. It makes it flexible. It's not prescriptive. It allows you to set your own realistic goals in life, not to try and live by unrealistic goals. So this is the freedom, you could argue, to flourish, the freedom to, for a person to flourish. I want to be able to be what I want to be, and to flourish, and to take control of your own life. And, and the person who cannot take control of their own life is someone who cannot intellect exercise the intellectual virtues. If you can't exercise the intellectual virtues, in what sense are you free? You can't become a moral person. So this, on this view, it is for a person to make the choice to find the right thing to do. Okay. So can we think uh, of examples of being non... So you can put down, examiners love examples. What does this strength mean? Well, you could talk about in, this, in terms of sexual ethics. I want to do what I want to do with whomever I want to do it whenever I like it. And you can't tell me what to do with my private life. There's an example of a freedom of um, this of non-normative ethics. Sexual ethics is an area uh, where people want freedom. Think about medical ethics. What about abortion, euthanasia? I want the right to end my life when I'm in pain or to terminate this pregnancy. These are all examples of uh, when modern people think of freedom as a good thing. Uh, you might criticize that, but that's, those are examples that could be given. The origin of this idea of absolute freedom is not actually um, Friedrich Nietzsche. It actually goes all the way back to the Greeks, to Epicurus. Um, he said, imagine there's no heaven or no hell. That wasn't John Lennox. It was actually Epicurus. Um, later on, Plato would say, but, or, but the problem with Epicureanism is, is that sort of freedom is difficult to live with. We need in a society rules uh, to abide by. We need a strong leader in Plato's re Republic that he talked about to, to guide us. And Nietzsche would come along and say that, that we should reject such platonic stuff and seek the, to, the will to power our own freedom. And later Karl Popper as well would talk about the open, the, uh, Plato as an enemy of the open society. And the existentialists, again, 
talk about the terrifying freedom when you realize that you know there's no God or no meaning, no purpose in life, and so on. So that's number one. Uh, it's it's non-normative. Number two of our six strengths. So Aristotle said it's culturally relative. So it's non-normative. This is a related idea. It's culturally relative. Aristotle said that virtues are culturally relative. Specific to a particular culture is a set of virtues that might not fit another culture. Now, this would support the view that no culture is superior to another. All cultures are morally equivalent. And the theory allows the ideas of virtue will, will vary amongst cultures. Now, immediately people will disagree with this. Some people see Western society as a great culture, much better than primitive cultures. Um, a guy called Hegel promoted that idea. And you find it a lot today in politics of perhaps the right. Um, and that can be anachronistic. The people in the past are, are perfectly sensible. Uh, people in other parts of the world are perfectly intelligent. And it can be a, a, a real um, weakness to think that other people are less culturally developed, less intellectually developed as, as we are. Um, the context of Homer's virtues as well. Homer talks about the virtues of the warrior, whereas Aristotle talks about the virtues of the civic society. Shows a little bit of this. So saying something's culturally relative uh, is beneficial for our society. It means that, uh, that any society in the world can use virtue ethics, um, any society, and identify what's good for that society for themselves and work out the correct virtues. Now, what kind of virtues are relevant for us today? Um, what about the civic virtue of democracy? of being, and in democracy that includes several things, being um, both critical uh, of power, critical of people who want to have power over us, but at the same time being civic-minded, uh, being wanting, a person who contributes to the good of your society. And those are examples. Remember, exa examiners love examples, right? An example. So, strength number two it's culturally relative. So it's non-normative, it's culturally relative. Number three, okay. I'm just gonna check the chat. I can't see the chat on my screen. If you wanna ask a question, do shout out. Uh, otherwise, I'm gonna keep going through our six weaknesses and then I'll, I'll talk with you more. Okay. Uh, Strength number three, it's liberal and accepts mistakes. Um, what do we mean by it's liberal and accepts mistakes? Well, virtue ethics allows that we learn about ethics over time, that we can develop. And surely that's realistic. Children aren't born with virtue. They have to develop it. We assume people are virtuous without any room for them to develop. That doesn't give them... Um, any any real opportunity to develop. So virtue theory takes into consideration the whole person. People aren't judged simply by one mistake. Their the whole life that they have lived uh, is taken into consideration. All of you know, and perhaps in hindsight, from almost the end of their life, before you make a judgment about the person's life. And as long as you're making an effort to change your personality or are attempting to practice the virtues, then you're doing the right thing. So mistakes are to be tolerated on virtue ethics. Now, um, there are a great many things we could say about this. Uh, within comes to mind, you know, if Jesus would be against the Pharisees who were always judging people for one mistake, not looking at the overall round of their life. It seems that's the way Jesus judged people. Um, so three, it liberates, it's liber liberal and accepts mistakes. A person develops, they move through different stages of their life. And it's possible to be both vicious and virtuous 
over the course of your life. I know, in, in for example, in COVID-19, you know, there, I've probably developed some vices as well as perhaps some virtues because I'm, you know, responding to situational features. And this theory says that there's, this is a, a positive view of human nature. It's concerned with reform, not retribution. It's concerned that a person can change and develop their nature. So virtue ethics is non-normative. Virtue ethics is culturally relative. It's liberal and it makes mistakes. I'm going to ask you to repeat these back to me in a second if you can remember them. Okay. Number four. Ollie, yeah, I'll pause. Did you want to? No? We'll carry on unless you want to ask something. Okay, carry on. So virtue ethics number four or six is de developing this idea of it is, is that it's liberal and it's, it's humanistic. Now, so what do we mean by humanistic? Well, it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessary, it could be, you could have virtue based on a divine command or a Bible, there are virtue, and we'll see this in in next lesson. We look at Aristotle and his not actually Aquinas and his use of virtue ethics. But you can just as well be an atheist and, and believe in virtue ethics. You don't have to have an absolute source of morality to justify holding to a particular virtue. I often say my my father-in-law, who was an atheist for many years, was a much more virtuous individual than I am. I'm not a very good Christian. I have many vices, not least of them uh, Ben and Jerry's uh, chocolate ice cream with little bits of um, um, brownies in it. I can think I could list my vices all day long. And my father-in-law would never deem to, you know, take such tr trivial thing as Ben and Jerry's ice cream. It's a much better, much more moral person. I'm not a very nice person in many ways. And some, you know, after I've marked a load of year nine essays, I'm not very nice. Um, it doesn't need a God to justify why to be moral. Uh, you can be vir virtuous and be an atheist. Uh, it gets its backing from humans. And what we find in humanistic theory, what it benefits humans. So it has a lot of attraction for non-religious people. So anybody can follow this theory. That's the idea, religious or non-religious. And if we take the example of British society, you might argue that, and this is what Elizabeth Anscombe argued, there has been a great moral vacuum caused by the decline in religion and the rise in postmodernism in society. And virtue ethics could fill that moral vacuum. The people, uh, the more people become virtuous, the better our society will become. You can also give direction and guidance to those that are lost, adrift in empty space. S students, children, there's a great move, and I've studied this for my doctorate, on character education. I want to throw a couple of scholars in. Under humanistic, uh, one of the scholars that I named earlier is this lady here, uh, Martha and she writes about virtue ethics, that it's compassionate and caring, takes the whole person into account. And it's interested in, here's a key word for us today, well-being. Think about mental health and well-being. And the fulfillment of the individual. There's a big connection between well-being and happiness. And happiness for Aristotle is the life that reaches its potential. People who feel their potential is being achieved, their virtuous potential, are more likely to be happy people, um, Nijbom would argue. And she has a point. And so virtue ethics can help with uh, mental health, as it were, and well-being. Another scholar, Robert Solomon, has argued the very idea 
that the good person is one who acts according to the right principles, makes my blood run cold. <laughs> he emphasizes that all the time the importance of the person, after all, is the object of the moral discourse. So Robert Solomon says, in the end, morality should be about creating moral beings, moral agents, not about simply sticking to the rules. So, uh, Ollie, can you name our four virtue summaries so far? Virtue ethics is non-what? Non-normative, culturally rel um, relative, liberal and humanistic. And humanistic. Um, have you got a microphone flow today? Just don't know if you haven't, um, you can not speak. <laughs> okay, right, you know microphone. I might, uh, I'll, I'll figure out something to include you in the quick Q&A in a minute. All right, we'll keep going. Um, so five, oh, um, it fits with a religious point of view. We said a little bit in this already that it's, it, 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 it's kind of flexible um, as well. So it's humanistic. You know, if you're an atheist, you can use it. But if you're religious, you can use this theory. You can choose for your virtuous example a religious person who inspires you. Well, if you're an atheist, I don't know, David Hume, Elvis Presley, Gandhi, whoever you want. But you could choose Jesus as your example of a virtuous person. You, uh, the Christian is someone who likes to be literally a little Jesus. Someone who, in fact, the word Christian means someone who's copied the virtues of Jesus. And becomes like Jesus, a little Christ, is what the word Christ means. It was because the the Christians in the main church of the first few decades after the death and resurrection of Jesus, and the church in Antioch, about 90 miles north of Jerusalem, and they did the first recorded act of charity. And this act led to them being called Christians, little Jesuses. They copied the virtues of Jesus. And today, Christians use what would Jesus do to think, what are the virtues of Jesus? How can I be inspired by them? And many examples of Christians, Mother Teresa and any other Christian saints who, and writers who inspire Christians. So, moral heroes. Moral heroes uh, like Mother Teresa would inspire people to think, what would Jesus do for themselves to try and copy and be like Jesus? So a Christian can say, therefore say uh, that they're interested in virtue and seek to maximize the virtues that Christianity cherishes. And I will say more on that tomorrow. What are the virtues exactly that Christianity cherishes? And when we look at Aquinas and virtue, we'll dig into this a bit more. Oh, just so, just to preface tomorrow, uh, tomorrow's lesson, Aquinas, using Aristotle's thought, talks about the relationship between Christianity and virtue ethics. And so, for example, he says it takes a, an intellectually virtuous person to understand the difference between true and false goods, internal and external goods. It takes someone with intellectual virtue to understand the, the difference between, well, to understand the cardinal virtues, which can be understood through the intellect, through reason, but it takes someone who's open to religious experience and the, to understand the theological virtues that are revealed virtues of faith, hope, and love. And, and this would get developed into a whole plethora of Virtues. There's a passage in the Bible that talks about um, the, the, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and so on. These are virtues. Okay. One scholar on this, this scholar here, um, called Leslie Stephen, um, says, morality is internal. The moral law has to be expressed in the form, be this, not in the form do this. The true moral law says, hate not, instead of kill not. 
The only motive stating the moral law must be as a rule of character. So the law, the Bible talks about the law is written on our hearts. It needs to be, uh, it needs to be in, internalized, not just a rule that we follow, but a, a position of the heart, we, something we become. So uh, it's non-normative, number one. It is uh, culturally relative, number two. Uh, what's number three, Flo? Type it into the chat. Go on. I forget. Come on, help me out. Non-normative. It's culturally relative. It's... Well, I think look back your notes. Okay, I'm trying to memorize this. It's non-normative. It's culturally relative. Okay, it's let's look at it then. So, does the idea of you know how um, is what the fifth one was fits in with religion? Yeah. Does it not um, sort of counter? Uh, natural moral law a little bit because Go on. the um because you're not born with um virtues or morals in this one but whereas in what a lovely thing to say what a, an insight uh ollie and it thus speaks you might argue john calvin we're not born with any virtue oh well calvin differs from aquinas on an important point Aquinas thinks original sin has affected us, but it hasn't affected our intellectual abilities. Ollie, what do you think the, the implication of that is? Um. What part of it would it sort of affect? Yeah. yeah. So if our intellect, our reason, is not affected by sin, then we can use our reason for what? Well, good, I suppose. Yeah, arriving at moral theory. And hence, Aquinas develops a whole superstructure of moral theory. Mm. And John Calvin, the great Protestant reformer, with his tulip theory, as it became called, believed in the noetic effects of sin. He rejected Aquinas' confidence in human reason and logic and claimed with Luther, sola scriptura. Uh, we can't trust logic and reason. We can only trust the Bible. Revelation. And that's one of the great things that splits uh, the Christian church between Protestant and Catholic. Only. Cracking insight, really, really good, Ollie. That's really good. Um, okay, we're going to crack on then. Uh, so flipping through really quickly. So it's non-normative. It's culturally relative. It's liberal. So it's flexible. It's humanistic. It fits relation, and it encourages community and rejects individualism. Let's have a look at this. Um, so. VE encourages community and rejects the individualistic approach to ethics by which we might be thinking Kantian ethics, we haven't done yet, I know. Perhaps we might be thinking natural moral law, but I'm not sure uh, that's in mind here. Particularly probably Kantian ethics, which is quite individualistic. You do the right thing because that's the rule. Um, what do we mean by that? Well. In the 20th century, the person who revived in the 1950s virtue ethics was this lady here, Elizabeth Anscom. And she bemoaned the state of ethics for the ordinary man, that there was a moral vacuum. There were no practical systems of ethics that ordinary people could use. Following the destruction of Christian ethics by utilitarianism, by David Hume, by logical positivists and all this, these bunch of people. So Anscombe said, accepted, basing everything on reason and rules and laws has not worked. Utilitarianism has not worked. Uh, natural moral law in a way hasn't worked. Um, Kantian ethics 
hasn't worked. It's a very man male way of approaching ethics on reason. A more gentle and you might say feminist approach, and by gentle I mean strength that is controlled, approach is a recognition of the value of relationships and community in building life. Rather than me working out on my own, having to do the ethical life in the context of other people. So, help me out here. This is the summary of the strengths. Um, so, Flo, give me, can you type in or can you shout out one thing? You still, you still there, Flo? Um, to do with uh, the, the first strength of virtue ethics. I'm assuming you haven't got a mic. Well, because I haven't heard from you at all today. Not, not hearing her at all. Okay, we'll we'll move on. Um, work with me, Ollie. Then, uh, give me a summary of, what, of what number one. What have you put down? Um, it's non-normative, so non-legalistic. Yeah. Uh, allows more freedom. Um, but I also put about how it can be a weakness of terrifying freedom and um hold on okay so we're moving on to the second one so yeah, yeah right we'll take it one bit at a time so it's non-normative virtue ethics is flexible it doesn't demand prescriptive duties doesn't set unrealistic goals go on what's the second one um culturally relative culturally relative very good and summarize that for me um it doesn't um, it sort of suggests that all cultures are um, morally sort of equal and relative, and um, allows that the uh, I don't know. okay allows um, around allow, oh, allows that the um, the middle ground and sort of golden mean may be different in different cultures, but it doesn't mean they're less. Um, virtuous than others. Okay, very good. Number three, what's number three? Um, liberal and accepts mistakes. Yeah. Sort of judges uh, people generally by their whole um, life uh, rather than just one mistake. And it's all more realistic and is a process rather than a something that you're expected to have from birth. Like a, okay, humanistic, what's that mean? Um, it's focusing on humans and doesn't require a God and can be based um, sort of entirely on sort of practicality and efficiency for humans and sort of the, the, their maximum enjoyment. And Very good. Uh -huh. Number five, what was number five? Nearly there. Uh, fits in with a religious point of view. Um, yeah. Promotes a Christ like morality and also allows for um, religious figures to be moral heroes. Brilliant. And number six? Encourages community. Yeah. Uh, as strict legalism and utilitarianism haven't worked. And, um, it also has a focus on sort of, um, a, the, uh, Aristotle put a bit of focus on um, how the happiness of community is yeah. um, linked in with the happiness of the individual. Brilliant. That's absolutely outstanding. That would be full marks, Ollie. Absolutely full marks. Um, right, we'll crack one. So that's the 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 strength. Can you see any off the top of your head any weaknesses from that list, Ollie, that you could flip? Um, I don't know. I don't. Can you think of any weaknesses before we go through them? Well, the non-normative, I suppose, it's can potentially be um, a little bit too free. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can get sort of antinomial stuff. Great language, yeah. Antinomial, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. You remember that from situation ethics? Mm. Brilliant. 
Okay, let me take you through it here. So we're going to use, again, um, uh, that's not right. Oh, there we go. So that's uh, our overview of what we've just done. Um, so it's it's weaknesses, again, it's actually because it's non-normative. Ancient values, judgment, foot, elitist, elitist and virtue ethics. Um, virtuousness ignores a whole range of desiring motivation. Talk about it. It's, it's a weak theory of motivation. It comes up in a second. Okay. <clears throat> Flipping the non-normative, you're absolutely right, Ollie. Um, its strength is its weaknesses. It's a, it doesn't give a, a list of prohibitive acts, and it doesn't formulate. Uh, it doesn't give you a method even of formulating such a list. Now, this then, a bit like in situation ethics, uh, can it be used? in terms of legal and policing and everything else, laws. And how do you punish people who act immorally? Um, can you punish someone for not being virtuous? Or, you know, how does that even work? Um, virtue ethics claims to be interested in the society, but how can a society develop when there are no rules? It just seems to encourage anarchy. Um, uh, we talked about how virtue ethics would help our society overcome its moral vacuum but doesn't it create a moral vacuum if there are no moral rules no normative structures how can you help people become moral and the people that are lost will remain lost nothing to guide them if there's nothing for them to follow look at these pictures of our football hooligans you know you do wonder and will they ever reach their true potential <laughs> Maybe they think they have reached their true potential. Is um, is the idea sort of your the the middle ground and sort of the golden mean? Is it also subjective to like your own personal view of what that is? Well, yes, that's one of the critiques that mm. it's an endless subjectivity, relativity, mm. um. So you can surely justify, um, uh, sort of. Um, more what someone would use, what someone else would see as a vice, or more on the vice side of a virtue, and claim that that would be the golden mean of the virtue. Yes. Oh, okay. the, in my view, Ollie, this is my my talking's worth. I have thought about this. Um, is what you need is virtue ethics would work if you had a perfect virtuous person who could hold up a standard of virtue to. In be inspired by. Now, Ollie, you could imagine as a Christian what I might say would follow on from that. What sort of thing would, yeah? Yeah. You can see, uh, and in the absence of, of such a source of virtue, we're blindly groping in the dark, and, you know, it, it just becomes, you know, contradictory versions of virtue ethics. No, I'm, I'm up for the marketplace. I'm up for society. If someone thinks they've got a perfect standard of virtue, I'd like, I'd like to, to see it. I'd like to, for them to hold up their perfect person who is an example of virtue. Um, I, I think for myself, Jesus probably stands up as a, a fairly good example of virtue, despite what Palmer and other people in the 18th century said. There we go. So we can flip non-normative. Here's a couple of other things. You might have, you might put down Ollie at our flow if you're still online. Um, she's if, up. She's not. She's not. She's gone. <laughs> Just the two of us. That's all right. That's all right. It's it's circular reasoning. Look at this. What should I do? Do what the virtuous person would do, says Aristotle. Who is the virtuous person? The person who does the right thing. How do I know what is the right thing? Because it's done by a virtuous person. But who is a virtuous person? The person who does the right thing. And that's almost funny, isn't it, Ollie? The sort of circularity of, of reasoning. Um, now, different societies have different cultures and they value different virtues. And this becomes pronounced. Um, Christendom and the Christian culture of the West val uh, saw pride as one of the main sins, the seven deadly sins, the chief of them was pride. 
was the 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 the, the gateway vice to so many other vices and humility would be the opposite it would be the gateway virtue to so many other virtues but for aristotle he actually saw pride as the the crowning virtue pride is a crowning virtue aristotle and nietzsche would support him in this so the great souled man now that doesn't give you shivers i don't know what does think about hitler as the great souled man um hmm there's an interesting point to to think about again on this non-normative uh, weakness uh, how do we make a list of virtues as we said the scholars all disagree virtue ethical scholars cannot agree on a list of virtues that are appropriate Give an example, Keenan, I mentioned earlier, lists prudence, justice, fidelity, self-care, and mercy as the chief virtues. Whereas Rachel, uh, Rachel uh, suggests courage, honesty, loyalty towards friends as the chief virtues. So scholars can't agree on the virtues. Oh, welcome, Izzy. Welcome. Uh, let's talk about virtue and vice. Uh, and the weaknesses we've got on to we've done the stretch during the weaknesses of virtue ethics so good to have you so we're on one of six so at number two uh ancient values now what you find is with virtue ethics a lot of ancient values get smuggled into the modern world and are these values really applicable today um the sort of stoic values typical of aristotle can we really apply Aristotle to today? Ancient civilizations were very, very different. And what is good for them is not necessarily good for us. So even with the additions of Aquinas um, and his theological virtues, is that relevant for us today? And that's, those are general questions that would be given. Um, just by the way, examples, examples of the theological faith, hope, and love. In our secular society, those revealed virtues, in what sense would they be um, applicable to the contemporary person who would reject revelation? And the, the four cardinal virtues, you know, uh, temperance, take temperance. How about, you know, for people who, who binge on Netflix, uh, you, know, you know, who want to watch an entire series of Love Island, sounds like something tortured, you know, yeah. Is that relevant? Okay, so it's non-normative. Uh, ancient values are problematic. So why in particular? Well, the Aristotle said society and individuals should value as the highest thing the contemplative mind. Now, I do think he has a point. I think our... Uh, you know, our society is amusing itself to death with not just television, to quote an old book from the 1980s, but now with these little devices in our hand, we are being um, distracted to death. I used to argue Walt Disney was the most dangerous man in the world, and now it's probably, oh, I don't know, um, you know, somebody from Facebook or something. Um, these ancient values are, are not what we are. So we like to be workaholics. Uh, Aristotle didn't like the idea of labor and hard labor. He thought it degrading to the mind. But we need factories to produce stuff and people to, to be in factory lines. Okay, so uh, ancient values, it's non-normative of our six weaknesses. Uh, judgment, number three, judgment. Virtue ethics creates real problems for the judgment of people. So how do we judge people? Um, you know, can we judge a criminal on how virtuous he is? Well, Aristotle, we remember, came up with these four types of people. The virtuous person, the continent person, the incontinent person, and the vicious person. Well, that sounds a bit you know, nasty to judge people and say, and pigeonhole them like that. Um, 
What about the person who acts once immorally by accident? Whilst trying to be virtuous but makes a mistake. Surely that's wrong to say they're then vicious. And how do we know when someone is trying to act virtuously but maybe makes a mistake? It's difficult to decide who is virtuous as external acts of virtue. And things that, you know, there might be an internal desire to be virtuous. Um, so what the, the relation between external and internal, between motivation, um, is problematic. And how to judge when someone's being virtuous. So this links to the complaint of non-normativity. You can't judge when someone is virtuous or not if you don't have a rule or a, an example to judge by. Can you create a society where there are without rules and a government where there are no set rules to live up? It doesn't seem we can in any practical way. So uh, it's non-normative, it's um, the problem of ancient values and the problem of judgments. In the end we can ask, is it a selfish theory? And what about the problem of conflicting virtue? The emphasis on personal development, even communal development, rather than the effects of our actions, is selfish. You know, it doesn't matter that we as a, a community, you know, persecute that minority because we develop such and such. Now, Aristotle had slaves and was well used to the persecution of minorities. The Aristotelian society was built on slavery and lots of prejudice and racism um, or ethnocentrism, if you remember your unit on racism, historic racism. Um, Aristotle gave no guidance in situations where virtues conflict. Moreover, uh, it's hard to think, but there, there could be examples of when virtues conflict. Um, you know, temperance, you, you want to have, you want to be moderate. But maybe there are times it's good to be extravagant and to ha just have fun. Um, and, and the proper virtue would be to sell, be civic celebration. So some types of virtues, civic virtues, might come, might kind of clash with moral virtues, to give an example. Um, I named uh, uh, this as a key scholar. We're going to return to her. Her and uh, uh, Foot, Philip of Foot, and Alistair McIntyre, the two named scholars. And she has a certain argument at the centre of her thinking that does point towards a weakness, in fact, although she's a keen on virtue ethics, she understands its weakness. She argues a bit like this. She says, virtue ethics, using virtue ethics, you're supposed to aim to a life, your life towards the greatest good, a sense of personal flourishing. That's Aristotle. And she says, my wisdom should be benefit both myself and others with whom I have dealings. You know, there's not just for yourself, but your community. However, in cases of charity and justice, it may be that I might and must sacrifice my own interests for those of others. Oh, I may have to give up luxuries so that the basic needs of others might be met. Oh, sometimes the right thing for me to do is not good for me. There seem to be situations where there is an absolute sense of goodness. Now, that, it's that moment there. Point it out. There seem to be situations where there is, quote, an absolute sense of goodness, vicarious, sacrificial love for others, in which there's always a correct sense of morality. And this refutes Aristotle's claim that goodness is dependent on humanity. If there are situations where it's right to act sacrificially, altruistically for others, at one's own detriment, this seems to transcend human goodness. So Philip of Foot argues for a hybrid theory, which we'll look at in another lesson. Another scholar, taking it, this is more of extension work uh, from the previous century, Hugo Grotius argued that truth and justice are not middle ways. Can you ever be, uh, is there a middle ground on truth and, and on ethical absolutes? Is there a golden mean to truth? 
Well, Aristotle himself says honesty, you know, you can have, you know, so these are problems. Goodness as well. So virtue ethics doesn't deal with the problem of people doing wrong, uh, thinking they are acting virtuously. We've, we've already named this, and, and he argues this. Lewis Pogeman, this guy in the bottom left here, thinks uh, torturing the innocent. Surely that's wrong. Is there ever a golden mean about how much torture is acceptable? You know, we need moral systems which absolutely forbid these things. Now, he's a Kantian, modern Kantian thinker who would say that. So modern Kantians, deontologists like Pogeman, think there is a duty never to punish, torture someone. Right, five of our six weaknesses, we're doing well. We're going to bring it into land shortly. Virtue ethics can be considered quite elitist. It's elitist. Aristotle claims the person who does not have a formal education can never reach true morality. Wow! You guys are all right. You're in a grammar school. You are the cream of the crop. You're obviously, you've, you've achieved this, you know, the highest possible education. Don't think about that too much. Um, the, especially in the current kind of situation of looking at this little screen. Um, Aristotle, you know, you know, it says it's not because they've been educated in the virtues, but because they have had the correct character building experiences. So at the grammar school, you are made to do six laps of the field. Suck it up, buttercup, you know, learn resilience, you know. Uh, we actually have virtues in marling learning habits. We talk about open-mindedness and intellectual curiosity. These are intellectual virtues, but they are elitist, it can be argued. Um, what about people who don't have these opportunities to be educated this way? It seems wrong because someone is, who is uneducated and poor it's suggesting they cannot be moral because they're not given the proper education. Um, these people, you know, it's not, you know, judging people. Like, these people, in order to make a moral action, will have to overcome stronger moral dilemmas, situational features. And the journey that you should always judge someone, I think, on the journey they take. I used to work with drug addicts. And many of them died, but it was incredible to see some of the journeys they would take. You'd always judge someone on the journey that they take, not on the end result. Elizabeth, oh, sorry, Julia Annis, one of our more up-to-date virtue ethicists, is, or critic of virtue ethics, says this. He says, ethics should be kinder, gentler place if we would forget about the hard cases and talk about friendship and the good life instead. Like much nostalgia, this is misplaced. So we have to avoid false nostalgia. And virtue ethics is guilty as looking back at a golden age, the age of Aristotle and the Greeks. There were great weaknesses in his age, not least of it, slavery. Okay, let's see if we can remember the first five. It's non-normative. Uh, who's here? What's the second one? Uh, Ollie, and then we'll go to Isabel. It's uh, based on ancient values. Yeah, and these ancient values are not the values that are important to us today. Uh, number three weakness, Isabel? I don't know. Don't know, okay. Uh, Ollie, do you know? Judgment. Yeah, uh, it's judgment, it links, um, how do we make proper judgment on the theory? Uh, either of you remember what number four is? Uh, the scholar foot. Yeah, so the scholar foot and her are, do you remember what our, go on, see if you can remember um, The. Oh, he disappeared. Cool. Yeah, go go ahead. Um, ab some things seem to be absolutely moral, and um, uh, if you aim, you can't 
aim for your own and communal ha uh, happiness um, uh, simultaneously sometimes as charity seems to hinder your own interests. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. And then uh, lastly, number five, it's elitist, okay. Last then, number six, uh, for, it's the virtue ethics ignores hedonistic motivation. What do I mean by this? Well, I, you know, a lot of unvirtuous stuff is very motivational. Um, should it be? There's an interesting question. Uh, I often use chocolate. You know, tell me you don't do this, Izzy. Come on, talk to me here, Izzy. Have you ever used chocolate to motivate yourself, Izzy? No. Oh, I, I this this what go on. What what's what's your motivation? If I write this essay, I'm gonna watch is it an episode of something on TV? Come on, you must have a vice, Isabel. Come on, spill the beans. Don't worry, that's being recorded for all posterity. <laughs> Ollie, what's your advice? Oh, go on. Tell me, what motivates you? Um, I don't do, I can't eat chocolate, so I usually, um, I play an instrument or go for a run. Oh, that's just too good, Ollie. That's, uh, Ollie, that's disgusting. That is just, you're, <laughs> you're too virtuous. What do you, I, I, I don't believe him. Do you, Isabel? Can't be that good, can he? I'm, all right, I'm moving on. Uh, my humor is, is getting um, an excess of um, whatever it is. <laughs> okay, so um, hedonistic motivation is an important thing. Um, the golden mean might live, we mean we live dull, unmotivated lives where we avoid intense and full pleasures. Um, and, you know, I read the Bible, and there's a bit in the Old Testament where it said they had to go to Jerusalem and get absolutely hammered drunk and spend lots of money and have a great celebration. Feasts and fasts were part of the ancient world. I like a bit of feasting now and again, you know. I don't want to live a sort of mean life, a sort of golden mean life. Russell has the same complaint. Philosophers are constitutionally timid and dislike the unexpected. Few of them would genuinely be happy as pirates or burglars. You know, who doesn't want an adventure as a pirate or a burglar now and again? Um, being temperate the entire lives isn't, you know. Uh, C.S. Lewis said, the world would be a happier place with more alcohol. Well, yes. Now, his brother was an alcoholic, but that, we'll put that aside. So, are virtuous people really desirable role models, or are they just a bit stuffy and a bit kind of uninteresting. Um, this woman, Susan Wolf, says as a scholar, I don't know whether there are moral saints, but if there are, I'm glad that I'm neither I am one or nor those about whom I care are amongst them. Would you want to be a moral saint? Well, maybe, maybe not. Not everyone wants to cultivate the virtues and maintain their intrinsically good. It is true. Okay, so there we go. Those are the weaknesses. I haven't done a little list, but so we said it's non-normative. Uh, the problem of, you know, doesn't give us clear moral guidance. Ancient values doesn't deal with the problem of people doing wrong. Um, I'm thinking they're acting virtuously. And, you know, there are values from the ancient world. Why would we want to live by them today? Judgment. What virtues need to be cultivated most? We don't know. Uh, how do we know when someone really is making a, acting virtuously? Uh, as virtues have been relative in different cultures. Uh, one culture might value the intellectual virtues. Other may value physical courage. And Aristotle gave no guidance in how to make judgments in situations where virtues conflict and, and rules to guide our actions. And we thought, is it a selfish theory? It's individualistic on personal development rather than the effect, you know, of our action. Either my development, development of my society, whatever the consequences. Uh, Elizabeth Foote in particular argues Aristotle's claim to goodness is dependent on humanity being refuted uh, by selfless actions. It's elitist. And Susan Wolfe talks about uh, not wanting to follow 
moral sense. Okay, there's a lot going on in your lives at the minute, uh, but if you want to put this into practice, here is a possible exam question. And this is not a, you must do this, or I won't give you a UCAS reference. Absolutely not. We've done loads at the minute. So this is a suggested question. For practice, assess the claim that developing virtuous character is the best way of achieving eudaimonia. Okay, you could do that. Um, I will, I was, we'll do it like this. Um, Ollie, I'm going to task you with strength and Olivia with weaknesses. And we'll, do, we'll play tennis, table tennis or ping pong. List, give me a strength then. Uh, so we'll start with Ollie. You've got to give me a strength to finish off today. And then Isabel, you've got to give me a weakness. Off you go, Ollie. Give me a strength. It's liberal, uh, liberal and forgiving of mistakes. Excellent. Isabel, give me a weakness of... Uh... Lack of hedonistic value. Yeah, so it doesn't... Yeah, hedonistic motivation. Yeah, good. Back to Ollie. Oh, another one. One each. Um, it is humanistic. It's humanistic and it appeals to atheists. Isabel? Um, not everyone can achieve... Yeah, no. No, well done, Ollie. You <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was too soon, Isabel. Too soon. Okay. Well, now, before we just... Uh, before you leave uh, in today's lesson, um, there's our list of strengths and weaknesses. Uh, I have started recording um, to help you with, obviously, the mock exam. Uh, Ollie, I don't think I've had yours back yet. Isabel, I've had yours. Ollie. No, I'm, I'm, I'm on the last question. Crack, and if you can just email me that, just a nice Word document. I've done um, it all on paper as well because my um, Word documents aren't working, which might be a little bit annoying, but... Oh, are you going to, are you going to do photographs and send me photographs, or...? Yeah, that's what I do. Okay, okay, yeah, I'll, I can work with that, I can work with that, but... Yeah. Mm, I'm, if there's any possibility of you typing it up, that would be better, but that's fine. If that's what you can do, Ollie, that's what you can do. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Okay. Um, so, just to, sh to show you this, uh, where is it? There are... For uh, the Bodhisattva, I've done three more sections, working as hard as I can. Uh, I'm about to put up some sections on virtue ethics, uh, the anthology, work on that. So if, if you've got space, you should be carrying on with that work. Remember, there's a couple of passages, uh, practice questions I want you to go at for the end of term, three weeks away. So... Keep pushing. Well done on getting here today. Um, that's it for today, unless anybody's got any questions. I think that's all. That's all. Good stuff. Right. Good oh, you. Yeah. Um, oh, tomorrow, 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 tomorrow is also 3 p.m. I have another meeting tomorrow. Um, I hope you can make it. Um, Sorry about the change of times again. Um, but thanks for coming. Mm. Uh, so for the um, for the Marling Dynasty.